All right. I'm sorry. That took me a hot second to get up. Also, okay. If you are listening to this, I hope you're listening to this recording. I have absolutely no idea why spontaneously in week seven, this microphone stopped working. But now I'm going to use this podium mic. And we're all going to hope it works. Because you all could hear me, right? Like you could hear. It's not like my microphone just cut out before, right? I feel like you would tell me. I can't be that loud that you can all hear me without any type of amplification. If that's the case and I just forgot to unmute the mic, I'm going to die. Um, but okay, anyway, uh, we are finishing up our conversation around disjoint sets today. And by finishing up, I'm going to actually clarify what a hot mess Wednesday was. So thank you all for your patience. Um, today, uh, here you have a disjoint set. So remember, the disjoint set is the set of sets. Right now, in this disjoint set, we have four sets. Within the sets, we have these up trees. And we will use these up trees to reference the vertices that are sort of connected in the subsections. And so what I would like for you to do is sort of like draw out what the results would be after calling these three unions. And the things I would like for you to keep in mind is remember that when you call union, you find the representative of both of the two items you're unioning. That means that will tell you which of the two sets you combine. So you're not just combining two nodes, right? You're combining two sets. We are going to add the optimization of adding the smaller tree into the larger tree. If there is a tie, um, I am now realizing I can't remember how I tie broke in this case, but that's at least the optimization. So there might be multiple correct answers. Um, does anyone have any questions? That was a, my rapid fire summary. Okay, why don't you take a couple minutes, draw it through. You should end up with one tree at the very end and the Slido should be live. So feel free to fill that out too. Okay, now I mute. All right, how are we doing? Are we ready to talk about it? Maybe I should, okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do that thing where I like uh, move over to Slido, but it's probably gonna interrupt your view for a second. There we go, aha, let's see. Da -da -da -da. I can close this too. There we go, okay. Which set node ends up as the overall root after all the unions? Yeah, there might actually be 69 of you in the room today. Oh, so, okay, cool. Um, it's like 70 degrees outside, honestly, I'm impressed. Okay, let's see where we're at. Seven, it's 78 degrees right now? Well, that doesn't seem natural. Um, okay, cool, so we seem to agree that is uh, item six. Let's work through it and see what happens. So in our disjoint sets, here we've got our trees. So the first call, union of 2 and 13, the first thing I do is I call find set on each of those items. So when I call find set on 2, what value will it return back for me? It returns back the overall root. Yes, so two is two is its own king, if you will. So when I call find set of two, it will return back two because two has no parent. And so it is the root of its tree set. If I call find on 13, what is going to be returned back? Seven, yes. And what I'm gonna do is I sort of dive in using my map to the node 13, and these are up trees, which is a sneaky change from things we've seen before. So these nodes do not store children. These nodes store parents. So that's why we draw those arrows from the nodes up to the parent. So these nodes do not know who their children are. Insert concerning comment, uh, but they do know who their parent is. And so we would jump to seven, we'd say, do you have a parent? Yes, you do. We jump to 13, we'd say, do you have a parent? No, you don't. 
That's the overall root. So we are going to union by updating the overall root of the smaller tree to point directly to the overall root of the larger tree. So that will give us just two moving over to be a child of the seven. And what's nice about that is now we have not increased the height of the tree of seven. The tree of seven originally had a height of one, it stays a height of one. If I had instead not checked who had more nodes and added the seven to the two, I would have accidentally created a tree with a height of two, which is less performant. Cool, okay, let's see. Next one, okay, union four and 12. What am I gonna get back if I call find of four? I hear it, six, yes, six, exactly. Um, and if I call find of 12, what am I going to get back? Eight, yes, okay. So uh, we have these two trees. What is the weight, i.e. how many nodes, are in the tree whose overall root is six? Six, convenient, okay. And what is the weight of the tree whose representative is eight? Five, so who gets added to whom? Eight cuts to six. Eight cuts to six. Aha, there we go. So we just take eight and we add it over and we get this kind of funky looking tree. And so remember that all of these, these are n airy trees. They can have as many children as they want. And that's why this becomes such an efficient move to join sets. All I have to do is update one pointer, which is really nice. Okay, final piece, we're gonna union two and eight. Um, so what do I get if I call find of two? Seven, yes, it's the new, it, it, it got a new parent, it was adopted. Uh, and what do I get if I call find of eight? Six. Who is going to point to whom? Love it, yay, and then there we go. We have uh, one big happy family set here and the final overall root is six. Any questions? Yes. Yes. The, so, okay, here's the thing. I like went over those slides and I was like, what the frick was happening with those slides on Wednesday? I honestly still don't know because I went back to last quarter and I taught from totally different slides. I don't even know where these slides came from. Um, but the, I think the old slides had it where they were down trees and there was a collection of children I disagree with that, and so I'm very sorry for the confusion. And in fact, I'm pretty sure, yes, there we go, fine, yes, this will give us theoretically log n, more likely to be log n than linear, but not guaranteed. Um, I have a slide in here, I'm gonna talk exactly about that, where you'll see that these, instead of having a collection of children, they just have a set node parent that is either null or set to something. I promise I will clarify that in more detail. Any other uh, questions here? Yes. Is that an n-array tree versus a binary tree since the one child is So when I'm talking about a binary tree, we always say the runtime is log n, but what I actually mean, because I'm annoying and I'm just assuming we're obsessed with binary, is that we actually mean a log base two of n. If I have a trinary tree, it's a log base three of n. If I have a quad tree, it's a log base four of n. So if I have an n airy tree, it's a log base n <laughs> of n. Um, but in all of those contexts, we, the reason we just say log n is because that's actually considered a, con like a coefficient. And so we don't list that, we just sort of consider every type of log within the same complexity class, whether it's log base two, log base three, log base four. Cool. Yeah. What an interesting question. It's almost like we're traveling the tree anyway. Are there more ways that we could collapse it as we go? Is that where you're going with this? What a beautiful segue 
give me like four slides. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, wait, let's check. I can't remember where 12 originally was. Okay, so 12 was originally hanging off of the 11. And so right now, the answer is no, because we're just unioning two sets. So I'm just like asking 12, where do you exist? But very relatedly to our friend's question, wait for four slides and you will be absolutely correct. <laughs> I'm gonna introduce a new optimization for you that will um, show you how we are actually going to improve the runtime of this tree over time and over usage. Okay, um, any other questions before we dive into administrative stuff? Cool, feel free to put stuff on the Slido. I'll pull it up in a second. Um, okay, so uh, P4 officially is released, right? That ed post went out, I think, or I saw the draft of it, so if it's not out now, it should be out soon. Um, so P4 is your final programming assignment. Oh no, we're so sad. It's gonna be so hard though, so you'll have so much to keep you busy, yay. Uh, P, okay, so I will say just, this is um, an assignment written by a different professor. I actually haven't run this one personally myself, but I hear fabulous stories about it. I mean, like I did the assignment myself, um, but it was, I think, originally designed to be a two week assignment, but we are gonna give you three and a half weeks to do it. So it is going out today. It is going to be due the Wednesday of finals week. Now I could have been like, I'll just make it due arbitrarily on the Friday before, and then you can use your late days. And then I just decided, I don't care. It's auto-graded. Take as long as you need to do it. I just need all your grades by Wednesday. So I just set it to being due the last possible day of the quarter. But because of that, you can't use late days on it. So I just sort of like gave all of you free late days on it, really. So please know that you do have to turn this one in by that Wednesday of finals week. If you have leftover late days, you are, of course, welcome to use them on the exercises. You don't get anything for keeping late days. So use them, don't use them. It does not impact your grade whatsoever. Um, reminder, um, exercise three, regrade requests are due Sunday. Exercise five is due Monday. Exercise six will release on Monday. Uh, does anybody have any sort of assignment questions? Yeah. I have very uh, kindly asked my TAs to turn those around a week from today, but then we'll have to like double check them. So I, yeah, exactly. So I'm like usually not supposed to tell you in case we slip it. So like don't hold me exactly to it, but we're trying to get those back to you um, like a week from today we'll have them done so we'll hopefully release them the following weekend or Monday cool um, okay also like I sort of mentioned at the beginning of class I have no idea why but apparently the audio has just been cutting out like five or ten minutes into lecture when I was using the lapel mic I wasn't doing anything different I have no idea why um, but uh, I we have the recordings from last year that are pretty similar so we're going to post all of those recordings uh, if you are somebody that was trying to view those and then um, Bellman Ford was new this year so I added a YouTube video on those slides so you can go watch somebody do it and then very specifically like I did talk about it last year but I want to make it really clear um, the thing that you really need from those lectures to do P4 is how to implement Dijkstra's. So this morning I did like a real quick 10 minute like walkthrough of those four Dijkstra's pseudocode slides. Um, so all of that will be posted. Hopefully that fills the gap of any of the missing audio, but please let us know if you encounter any other weird recording issues because I don't know, there's just some, some weird vibes going on with this AV equipment. Um, I'm just gonna pop over to the Slido, see if there's any other questions. Ooh, aha, somebody has looked ahead in the slides. Congratulations, Anonymous. I shall answer this question along with our other friends' questions in a few slides. Let's talk about it. Okay. So, wow, all right. 
Um, okay, so let's dive back into disjoint sets. So like I said, I, I know the slides were a little messy on Wednesday. I went back and cleaned them up so they might look a little different. Um, but remember, a disjoint set is a set of sets. And specifically, what we're talking about right now is implementing them with this kind of tree situation where the overall object is the tree disjoint set. And it has a set of tree sets that we call the forest. So it is the collection of trees. It also has a field that maps every individual node's value to the specific reference for where you can jump in to get that node. So you don't have to just search through trees to find every node. That's the overall structure. The tree set in its forest field has a collection of tree sets. Tree sets store an overall root, and then you can just sort of add and get the representative and all that stuff. You can think of this as sort of that like subset within the disjoint set. And then the tree sets are made up of collections of set nodes. And to our friend's previous question, the set nodes have their data field, and then they have a parent field. This is how we make it an up tree. You're storing just one parent. And in this particular case, if your parent field then is null, that's how we know you're the root of your particular tree set. To make this even clearer, here is a kind of visualization for you. So there's one tree disjoint set. That's this like sort of container on the outside here. In this particular example, we have four tree sets. That's each of these circles here. And then we total, have a total of nine set nodes distributed across those four tree sets. Does anyone have any questions about this organization? I know it was a little murky on Wednesday. Hopefully this clears things up a bit. Yeah. I actually have a question about image. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. And I, I'm going to get to one more compression that makes it even more likely that we kind of officially start to claim log n. So, okay, cool. So, remember, when we make set, we just make a bunch of tree sets and we put one set node in each of those tree sets. And every time we make a new set node, we add an entry to our little where is it map so that whenever I ask, say, find two, I would start with this collection here. I think I called it node inventory. And I'd be like, two, where are you? And then I'd follow that reference and boom, I'd find that node. So that I get a find for the specific value of a constant time lookup. When I call find, I'm not specifically looking for that value. I'm actually specifically looking for the representative of the set that that value is contained in, so there's more runtime. But at least to get to any specific node, we get that constant runtime because of our little supporter hash map. Find, to build off of that, we start with our sort of supporter hash map. We dive into the item we're looking for, and then we just follow that daisy chain of parents up to the very top until we get to the parent equaling null, and that is what we're going to use as our representative. So we're going to use the overall root as our representative. That's also kind of why we use trees, because it's like there's sort of a built-in singular item that sits at the very top of the structure, so we don't have to keep track of these other numbers for the nodes. So that's literally why we use these sort of like tree sets to make the choice of representatives super convenient. Yes? So right now, this, I'm going to call this a map <laughs> that's here. This is a map that maps from the value of the node I'm looking for to the reference of where to find it. So this is specifically for when we're using set nodes because it's 
this idea that in order to find the thing I'm looking for, it exists in a node object, and the only way to get to a node object is to be given the reference for it, and it would be really inconvenient to search through all the trees to find all those nodes, but this way it's like we're sort of keeping a little like Rolodex to like immediately find where in memory those nodes are. Great question, because you're right. I think at the end of last lecture, I was like, sneaky, sneaky, you can represent this with arrays. We are going to eventually replace, you're right, kind of both of these, where the arrays will no longer store references to nodes, but actually they're just going to store indices in an array to tell you whose parent they are. And I'm going to get to that in a couple slides. So right now, we're still living in the land of like, these are real trees with actual nodes that are separate and we're using references to get to them. So this is like that stage of the heap before we got to the array implementation. So for right now, they are real trees. Um, cool, so yeah, so this thing's called the node inventory. It helps us find things, great. So when we're implementing union, the other reason that we use trees is because it's really convenient to mash a bunch of things together because trees sort of give us this way to like easily collect multiple items and then to reassign a parent that just takes a singular reference change. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call find on the nodes that I am told to union. So if I call find on Ken, I realize that Ken's representative is Joyce. And if I call find on Santino, Santino's representative is Eileen. And then I'm just gonna set one of those roots that I know has a null parent pointer. So I can just fill up that space without losing anything. I'm going to add point that sort of uh, overall root to the other overall root. And there I get that sort of result, as you can see. Now right now, this just is like, pick one of them, mush them together. And the reason that we can do this is because right now we just care about these items being associated together. Where they actually are in the tree is totally arbitrary. Eileen is not in some way higher up in priority than Santino. Like Sam and Ken aren't in some way less than or greater than Joyce. I just need these things to all be connected together. So I can get real loosey goosey with like how the actual tree looks like. As long as the things are all connected to the same overall root, we're good. Because remember our goal is just to make these things a set. The structure of the internal tree is just whatever makes it easier for us as programmers. So this slide is about like, why do you even care about finding the other root? I was sort of finding both of them and just like making one arbitrarily point to the other. Well, if I didn't find both the roots, you could theoretically accomplish the same thing where all the nodes have stuck together. If I just say like, instead of putting Joyce pointing to Eileen, which was the parent of Santino. Instead, if I just took Joyce and pointed her directly to Santino, meaning I didn't bother to find Santino's overall root, I would have saved myself an extra find, but you can see the height of the tree has grown. So that's why both times I'm gonna find the representative and I'm going to point one representative at the other, as opposed to dealing with any of the child nodes that are further down in the tree. So I'm trying to sort of push all of my changes as far up the tree as possible. Like my goal, theoretically, to have the best performing tree would be one overall root with all of the other nodes as its direct children. That would be the best performance because that's the shortest tree. But I'm gonna sort of let this play out naturally and I'm gonna show you how we get closer and closer to that ideal tree. So what's the runtime? Um, okay, so let's say we have initially this disjoint set, which is just four sets, A, B, C, and D, all independent of one another. If I call a union of A and B, both A and B are the same size, so it doesn't matter, I'm just gonna point A at B. 
If I call B and C and I don't pay attention to who is taller, doesn't matter as long as they stick together, I might end up with this type of situation. And so you can see how over time, if I'm not paying attention to who is the bigger tree, I do get to an N run time, unfortunately. This is how we get to that degenerate trees case. Now, we're not going to force balance, but we are going to do some things to statistically make it less likely to get to this degenerate tree. Because frankly, I know I talk about the degenerate trees because we've got to care about the conceptual, like what is the worst possible scenario? Like if you're ever being really stressed out in Odegaard and you're like, what will happen if I fail this test? And you're like, be homeless? No. It feels that way though sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> So we always have to actually check what is the possible worst case scenario, even though we all know it's very unlikely because you're all so hardworking and I'm sure you rarely totally bomb a test, yeah? So generally the degenerate case is pretty statistically unlikely. So previously with the AVL and the red black tree, we were like forcing balance. That was especially because those trees were all about lookup. So we really needed to avoid that worst case scenario. These trees are not so much about lookup. So we're going to sort of err on the side of ease to implement. And when I get to my friend's question about the array implementation, I'll show you how wonderfully elegant it is. But we are gonna start to do things, and this is a little different, that sort of hedge our bets. Like if you remember way back when we learned about hashing, Technically, there's nothing we can actually do to force a hash table to never be a degenerate. If you somehow have some weird data set that just has n collisions, you're just going to have, you know, a linked list. But that's why we did all those things about resizing and picking the right hash code to reduce the collisions. We were just trying to statistically prevent the worst case scenario. This is another one of those statistically prevent situations. So weighted union, like we talked about. Um, Weight in this case just means how many nodes are in that tree. So in the previous example, we had four nodes that each started as a weight of one. When I call union of A and B, they are the same weight, so it doesn't matter. We'll just point one to the other. But now I've got a B represented tree that has a weight of two. So when I call B and C, now I know that previously B must absorb C because it's got a weight of two. And then when I actually absorb it, I just add the weights together because that's what I did. I just took all those nodes and moved them over. So it's actually pretty simple code to combine the weights. And then the same thing, I call union of D and three is greater than one. And so D gets absorbed into B. And now look, instead of that line of four, I have one overall root with three children. So this is technically constant run time to find something. So now we've gone from worst case scenario of linear to best case scenario of constant. Now I showed you how in this particular case that weights really made a difference. But like I said, it's not enforcing it. Let's see what is given, even in our weighted union implementation, what is still our worst case scenario? So the worst case for the tree to grow as fast as possible is if I'm always unioning two trees that are the same height. If I union two trees that are of varying heights, then chances are, almost deterministically, when I add a smaller tree into a larger tree, that larger tree's height doesn't grow. It remains the same height. So I get sort of like a net neutral impact on the runtime. However, the one time that guaranteed the height of the tree must grow is when they are of the same height. That's when somebody's gonna have to go from being a root to a child, and that is going to extend that new overall root's height. So when I add two nodes together, I get a height, two nodes of like height zero, I get a tree of height one. Now I'm gonna union these two trees of height one together. Oh no, I end up with a tree of height two. 
I union these two trees of height two together. Oh no, I've got a, a tree of height three, and so on and so forth. So with our current optimization of the weighted union, this is exactly how weighted union would work. This is the new worst case scenario. So we've improved our worst case scenario from being linear to now we would refer to this as log n. But to our friend's previous question, it's like, yeah, but like it's an n-ary tree. So is it like a log base 2 of n? Is it a log base of n? Let's talk math. OK, great. So um, I'm going to show you a little bit as we get deeper into it. Um, but we would call this like uh, log, <laughs> log prime uh, of n. But right now, we've, got, we've improved our run times, make sets constant, find worst case scenario is log n, union worst case scenario is log n. And frankly, that union log n just comes from the find that exists inside union. The changing of the overall roots reference that's a constant time action, but finding really ends up driving all of the run times of the disjoint set. And when we go back to Kreskel's, because remember the actual reason I was subjecting you to all of these disjoint sets is we're trying to figure out how to implement that MST algorithm, Kreskel's. And remember how Kreskel's works where we sort the edges and then we ask ourselves, does this edge combine two disconnected islands? Now you can see what we're really doing is we're calling find set on the disjoint sets and we're checking are their representatives different. That's the equivalent of Wednesday me being like, are they on two different islands? Now in disjoint set world, do they have two different representatives? If they have the same representative, that means they're already connected in the same set. So that's how the disjoint set is going to be able to implement cross goals for us. And then when we select an edge, because we're like, oh, no, nope, they have two different representatives. They're two different island chains. We select an edge, and then we call a union, and we combine those. So that's how the disjoint set fits into cross goals. And so you can see that's how um, our runtime will be impacted there. So like I said, I was sort of deeply foreshadowing. I'm sure we're all chomping at the bit now to hear about this mystical thing, path compression. Let's talk about the final optimization. So this is um, actually kind of a unique optimization uh, that we're going to cover in this course, because this is an optimization that does not make the present runtime faster, but it over time improves the runtime for future calls. So as you use this disjoint set more and more, it gets more and more efficient which is a pretty fun category of optimizations. So here is a worst case situation. If we use as, used weighted union, we could still have these kind of like, uh, it's pretty tall. But when we do a find, we know we're going to walk the path of the tree. We're going to find something, and then we're going to jump to its parent. And if we realize its parent is not the overall root, we're going to remember that. So if I call find set of 15, I'm like, OK, 15, it's overall, it's parent. Oh, it's not the overall root. It's 14. Oh, 14's parent is not the overall root. It's 12. Oh, 12's parent is not the overall root. It's 8. And then finally, we get to 8. And 8 has a parent that is the overall root. What we're going to do is we're going to keep track of all of the nodes we happened to pass by as we did this find. And we know, as we traveled up the tree, that they should then all have the same representative. They were all in the same path. It just took me a few more jumps to get there. So what I'm going to do is just after I get to the final overall root, well, I'm just going to change all their overall roots to be the, like, all their parents to be the overall root. This is what we mean when we say path compression because I was walking a singular path when I called find on 15, and anybody that I encountered on that single path from 15 up to the overall root, I'm now going to make sure that they are compressed to just point directly to overall root. <coughs> yes. <coughs> mm -hmm. What a great question. Yes, absolutely. 
So you can imagine, there you go. I think that's a call after 11. You essentially end up with this kind of looking tree where you just get everybody sort of pointing it over a root. But you're absolutely right. If I called find on 11, I'd be like, oh, 11 has a parent, and it's not the overall root. 10 has a parent, and it's not the overall root. 8 has a parent. Ah, oh, it is the overall root at 0. So I'm going to update 10 and 11 to just point directly to 0. Cool. Any questions? Yes. from the get-go. So we're going to sort of optimize for ease of implementation and maintainability of code. And so when we initially do our unions, one, we can only add nodes by making set. And that means every set starts off as a single node. And then the trees can only grow by doing a union. And so I could theoretically, in every time I call union or find set, do this like traversal through the whole thing and be like, anybody that's in this set that isn't already pointing to zero, like, we'll just redirect you. But then I'm doing like a bunch of extra work to intentionally collapse the tree. And the like delightful genius of this approach is I had to travel that path anyway. So because I was already traveling that path, this optimization comes at no extra cost. So there probably are ways that we could implement it, but they would cost us a little extra to optimize early, and this is just like a no-cost optimization game. Okay. okay. So um, this is the part where I was like, it's going to get a little weird and mathy. Um, technically, to find the exact runtime in order to do this, we would have to do something called amortized analysis where we would do the worst case scenario and the likelihood that we compress and like the changing runtimes over the different changing of the trees. Like how do you tell the runtime overall when the tree starts as a linked list and then it ends up as this sort of like squat little tree? Um, you can look at these slides <laughs> and read into it. However, uh, makes you excited about math. I will let you decide if you want to do that. I'm not going to test you on it. Um, but this is where we get this concept of log star. And so log star is technically, according to amortized analysis, the worst case runtime on these trees once we've added both the union by weight and path compressions. I hope you just trust me, but you can read these slides if you want to know why that works out mathematically. Um, so uh, then if we go back around and we apply this to our Kruskals, well, we've got this sort of like O of V to initialize all of the like vertices as their own independent island. And then we've got to sort all the edges by weight, which we haven't talked about yet. Come back on Monday and Wednesday. We're going to do sorting algorithms next week. It's really exciting. Sorting algorithms are a good time. Um, so we'll talk about why that's an E log E uh, next week. But then we just loop over all of the edges. So that's an E runtime. And we call these fines, which we've just decided has a log V runtime. Um, and then we have a log V to union them. And so actually, in this particular case, because of MSTs, remember that an MST at most can have V minus 1 edges? That's how we prevent a cycle. Because of that, uh, like E actually ends up being an upper bound to V in this case. So. E kind of upper bounds V, and then that actually means what ends up happening is this time to sort actually becomes the dominating runtime in Kruskal's, which is pretty good. Sorting algorithms are considered pretty like E log V, or sorry, E log E, um, or N log N runtime is considered pretty efficient for a sort. And so really the takeaway isn't darn the sorts, but really, wow, we've somehow managed to optimize this structure to a point where it lives within this complexity class of essentially n log n. OK, final piece to the disjoint sets. OK, right, yeah, there we go. Array implementation. So 
here's a fun little trick. Instead of making separate nodes and actually finding the references and storing them all independently, we are going to make the observation that each node only stores its parent. So it just has one value that we really need to store for that node. So what I'm going to do is remember how in the heap we had the sort of indices representing the specific value and then the like index was or like the index or the element was the item and the index was where it sort of lived. It's kind of a similar thing here where we are going to have this sort of idea where each individual item is mapped to a specific index. So Joyce is considered index zero, Sam's considered index one, Eileen's considered index two. We did the same thing in the heaps, but I only used ints, and I think that can get confusing. Um, but then what we're gonna do is, as the actual element stored in the array spot for that given item, we're just gonna store the index of its parent. So if I come in here, I would say Sam points to Joyce, if I come into Sam's location, Sam stores the item zero, which means Sam's parent is Joyce. And what's really then convenient is if I say, try to look up Alex, I have some map that tells me Alex is stored at index three. I can see that it says, hey, Alex's parent is at index six, so I jump over to index six, and I see, oh, that's a zero, which means then I jump over to zero. And so now, the traversal through the up trees, instead of actually following pointers, is just hopping around indices of an array. Which again, the array, because of the contiguous memory, gives us such a, this is just super speedy. It's way faster to jump between indices of an array than it is to actually follow the arrows to get to all the nodes. And then you can see here, the little tricky thing we did is, for items that don't have a parent, we just put a negative number in there. That's how we know, guess what? You're at the top of the tree. You hit a negative, that's the equivalent of us previously checking if their parent field was null. Yes? I could put a number into something wrong, but wouldn't the negative number be the amount of nodes that have maybe supported the negative? What an excellent segue! What if on top of it, instead of, so like we previously had this like negative one to just indicate that it was the overall root, but what if we tried to even further jam more information into that box? Well, previously we were storing the weights as like a field in the node. Now we are just going to update the items stored as negative values in the overall root to be negative one times the weight of that tree. So, there you go, this is like a bunch of details. Great. Um, and as you can imagine, now we can also do path compression where we just sort of keep a set of everything we've seen along the way, of all the indices I've traveled through along the way, and I just go back through and I just replace all of the elements of those indices with my new overall route. Okay, let's see, you know what? Let's, I think we're ready for this. Why don't you take the last minute of class fill out this array representing this specific disjoint set. So you can see we have three separate tree sets. You can use the items value to represent the index in the array. So let's use index zero to represent this item zero and so on and so forth. And remember, you're going to store in the elements the parent. And if it is an overall root, negative one times the weight. Go ahead, fill out the array. Okay, I know I'm being an annoying instructor on a beautiful sunny day and it is officially the end of class. So I will just leave you with this. You are welcome to check your answers. That concludes our graphs unit, y'all. You made it through graphs, congratulations. Please come back on Monday. We're gonna start sorting algorithms, very fun. All right, have a fabulous weekend, everyone.